Okay, that was fun. We just did an essay on Eden by Hud Hudson. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone else's name that begins with Hud twice, but it was a fun essay. I realized why I screwed up my numbers. I don't think I did a philosophy roulette number 16, or maybe it's just lost to history. Um, let's see, here's some... Yeah, what happened between these two? I don't know what happened. But anyway. So, I like that suggestion. If you know of any other fun essays to review, I'm not... Uh, I'm not gonna be all that snooty and be like, I don't like that topic. I'll try it. I've so far tried, let's see, we did a feminist politics one the other day. This is a faith and philosophy one. It's uh, on the Garden of Eden. We've done a bunch of like analytic philosophy stuff because it's what I know best. But here's what we're going to just keep going for it. See what, if anything new came out in the last few hours. Oh, this agriculture and human values. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the problem is, of course, some of this stuff is like just well beyond anything. And let's go to the next 50. Let's see what the next 50 is. Um, this is what we're, oh, let's go a bit more farther back in time. Just a few more days. I mean, we're still on like March 20th here. I mean, wait, is this just today? No, no, this can't be right. This is like the today time. Okay. Oh, complexity. I don't want to do complexity. That's like technical stuff. Consciousness and cognition. Surface features can deeply affect artificial grammar. Oh, more technical. E -e -e -e. Constellations. Machiavelli and the orders of violence. Oh, there's a review. <coughs> Property and capital in the person. Lockean and neoliberal self-ownership mm -hmm. no nope uh, queer, terror, life, death, and desire in the settler society. Oh, we just did a contemporary political theory. That was one of the other ones. Uh, let's just see if it's here. Uh, Springer's not going to give it to me for free. Why would they do something like that? HTML. Maybe they will. Or is this just a... Uh... Oh, okay. It seems incredibly short. Oh, what did I just do? Why did I do that? Yeah, I should not have, uh, fussed with the, uh, sizing of the window okay well okay oh because it's a review all right so i'm not gonna review a review that would be a little bit uh unfortunate uh, are these all reviews and they might be yeah, Oxford University Press. Okay, so let's get past this thing. Critical Discourse Studies. And the meaning of work in a crisis-ridden Greece. This seems apt for the crisis-ridden state of the universe we are in, and I can't find out the important research that would actually help process the current situation. That's awesome. Aesthetic resources in contemporary Chinese politics. 
not something I would normally read. Honestly, maybe it would be. I'd be like, well, that sounds different. All right, I'm getting a little frustrated here, folks. I can't find anything available. I mean, it should just be like, folk, because I'm the only person listening to this right now, but what are you going to do? Yeah, this is, uh, got to get past all this stuff. Yeah. Come, ooh, Journal of Comparative... What did the Emperor ever say? The Public Transcription of Confucian Political Obligation. Alright, so let's see if this is available. Le uh, don't look like it is. Abstract, I am not spending $40. That's crazy. If I everyone would give this to you if they could. <laughs> Educational theory and philosophy and a essay on Heidegger. Come on, be available. <laughs> yeah, and what sort of ethics does Martin Heidegger really have? That would be a great thing to know. Ah, oh, shucks. And this website is just like... This is amazing. Like, yeah, I guess you people can see this. Like, this is an amazing website. I haven't seen something this broken since, like, 1997. I mean, I've got, like... Th my setup here is, like, 100% vanilla. This was an old computer that I repurposed for this thing. So I basically have a very fresh stall of Ubuntu, like the latest Ubuntu. So this is the latest Firefox. Like this is all like new, almost out of the box Ubuntu with like out of the box Firefox. Like everything should just work here. It's all from the last year or two. So the fact how broken that is, I mean, I've got no exceptions. The only extension I installed here is if you can see it is the, uh, little foot that's for the desktop so I can reload everything just as it was like the day before so I, this is a vanilla setup so the fact that anything breaks is just sort of crazy all right this is because I did all you know what I'm gonna have to new journal articles no this is all new journal articles what am I talking about all right so we're just gonna have to go to a journal then all right let's get you want to roulette the journals Chinese, oh, well, uh, Chinese Journal of Culture University. Let's do childhood and philosophy. All right. Oh, it's a uh, Spanish language. Cool. Eco-social citizenship education, facilitating interconnective, deliberative practice and corrective methodology for epistemic accountability. Philosophical inquiry with indigenous children, attempting to integrate indigenous knowledge in philosophy for with children. A normative approach. Alright, so you want to know what it's going to be? It says 1 to 12 and that's 1 to 22, so we're going to click on this one. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, it's Brazilian. I, They might actually... Oh, that might just be a reference. And let's see. Nope. Citation. Uh... Yes, I mean, they're going to be getting me with an evil PDF. Oh, it's a review. Shoot. I thought we got lucky for a second. Okay, let me try one of these. I don't want to do 20 pages. Let's find out, though. Oh, 
20 pages of... Okay. You know what it is? It might be 10 pages... Oh, no. I was like, is this 10 pages of uh, Portuguese? Let's check it out real fast. Nope, this is all 20 pages of... Okay, that's fine. We're going to do it anyway. So now the stream, so if you hit uh, exclamation game or game or exclamation mark paper, the uh, the fill paper page will show up here. Okay. And here we go. All right. You know what? Let's not, it's 20 pages. We can skip the uh, abstract. What is this in Portuguese and Spanish? Oh, cool. Triple language. In her paper, Has Dem Democracy Failed Ecology? An Eco-Feminist Perspective. <coughs> Val Plumwood, 1995, concludes that it is not democracy that has failed ecology, but liberal democracy that has failed both democracy and ecology. Hmm. Everyone's hitting on the liberalism uh, recently. She argues that the escalation of the processes responsible for ecological degradation, despite the great citizen effort that has gone into challenging them in democ democratic democratic politics, a polities, therefore represents an alarming failure. Or represents an alarming failure of the current liberal democratic political systems. Well, they have really done a bang-up job lately, haven't they? Liberal democracy, she argues, is an authoritarian political system. It's getting that way, it really is. With its military systems organized around protecting privilege, which controls so much of the planet. Yep. And as, as this 1995, yes, not a whole lot has changed in the last... 25 years and as a result fails to protect nature she does not however see democracy per se as inherently authoritarian the superiority is the superiority of democracy to other systems in detecting and responding to ecological problems would seem to lie largely than in its capacity for adaptation and correction so in order to discover why democracy is failing we must now ask which political features of democracy con contribute to and what forms hinder its capacity for correction? For Plumwood, a major obstacle that hinders this capacity is radical inequality, which she claims is both itself hindrance to correctiveness and a key indicator of hindrances of to society, societal correctiveness. She contends that radical inequality, which has become increasingly far reaching under a liberal democracy, is an indicator of the capacity of its privileged groups to distribute social goods upwards to create rigidities which hinder the de democratic correctiveness of social institutions. In the case of liberal democracy, economic privilege drives this story, stark, story of stark separation. The separation of the ecologically privileged from the ecologically underprivileged, of those deemed close to nature from those thought of as above or superior to nature. It is a separation that generally plays out along the lines of colonial violence and is a continuation of colonialization as will be explained. For a considerable range of environmental ills resulting from the institutions of accumulation, then some redistribution and insulation is possible. It is the privileged members of society who can most easily insulate themselves from these forms of environmental de degradation. Toxic waste and occupations can be directed toward to poor residential areas, including third world destinations. And if pres pr privileged suburbs, regions, or territories bec become noisy, degraded, or polluted, the privileged can buy places in more salubrious environments. Yep. The story of rich separated from the poor is a familiar one. The salubrious environments of the economically privileged privileged contrast starkly with those of the economically disadvantaged. Yes, the worst asthma in the country is in the South Bronx, a few miles from right here. Childhood asthma, that is. 
Although maybe everybody. The, uh, the privileging is not not restricted to the economic class, but to gender and ethnicity also. Plumwood says this divide is the most oppressed and dispossessed people in the society are those who are made closest to the condition of nature, who are made to share the same expendable condition as nature. Anthropocentrism, androcentrism, and ethnocentrism all combine to confer privilege in colonial cultures. Part of this disposition, dispossession is the dispossession of the voices of entire groups of people. A political voice is denied to those who are considered other. No political provisions are made for their pers for their perspectives, for their knowledge to be heard in any existential meaningful way, that is, in a way that leads us to a correction of their situation. For all intents and purposes, they are denied full epistemic legitimacy within the do dominant mainstream discourse, educationally, culturally, socially, and politically. The silencing of indigenous peoples and othering of their culture in Australia, both historically and today, is an example we will return to later. Globally, those in the most disadvantaged position positions are the ones most likely to suffer the greatest effects of anthropogenic climate change and economic injustice and other social and ecological ills while at the same time having the least political recourse to address such issues yeah i mean you don't want to be on one of those like island nations out in the pacific that where that's just getting hit by like hurricane after hurricane and just getting inundated with the plastic from the uh big industrial countries that's just floating out there it ruins those like beaches Plumwood argues that the liberal political system suffers from a communication problem making that makes ecological and social justice correction difficult, if not impossible. Often those closest to environmental systems, those with the most to gain from their preservation and the greatest understanding of the problems they face, are unable to protect the environment and thus must resort to means of resistance to protect themselves. Yeah. Plumwood's cautionary tale of liberal democracy has repercussions for education, especially civics and citizenship education. In this article, we imagine an alternative conception of democracy as an associated form of living that does not rest on the foundation of stark separations. To this end, our proposal is a response to Plumwood's call for radical democratic alternative to liberal democracy to facilitate dem democratic correctness, which he argues is the hallmark of democracy. We explore the potential of what Gerard Delanti calls cultural citizenship as an alternative to the disciplinary citizenship that permeates Western liberal discourses. Cultural citizenship emphasizes citizenship as communication and continu continual learning processes, rejecting the idea of citizenship as a legal status or a fixed set of cultural ideals, deals, norms, or values defined and enforced by a liberal society's legal, political, and cultural institutions, including education and citizenship training. While we concur with Delante on the potential of cultural citizenship, we contend that a critical first step essential to democratic correctness is to clear away obstacles created by epistemic violence. Yeah. Yeah, alright, so epistemic violence, is it? <sighs> Epistemic violence is a harm caused by the totalizing knowledge of the privileging of the single epistemic position to the deter determinant of all others. Uh, yeah, privileging of a single epistemic position. Okay. Yeah, that's called being a zealot, really. Well, at least that's how I think of it. Colonialization, a central system of power that dominates the surrounding land and all within it, including indigenous peoples who have been socio-historically constructed through first world Western knowledge systems that are ontologically and epistemically grounded in differentiation. Yeah, we have a very bad history of uh, defining away other peoples. Mm, just calling them that it messes up uh, how we think about things. Uh, Okay, grand differentiation can be viewed through the lens of epistemic violence, as can patriarchal and patrilineal societies in which men are primarily in roles of political leadership, moral authority, and so moral authority, social privilege, and can and control of property. In both cases, epistemic violence is structural and the foundation of, for built environments. Materially, excuse me materially, spatially, and culturally constructed surroundings intended for human habitation. 
is an environment that has undergone large scale changes, creating a habitat that has bias towards the epistemic, ontological, and axiological frameworks of the dominant culture such to such an extent that all humans and other species must adapt to that environment to survive, rather than a mutual adaptation of diverse habits and habitats that allows for space for dem democratic correctness, which in turn can reconstruct the environment materially, spatially, and culturally that is inclusive not just for humans but for non-human animals and ecological systems. Alright, so we've got epistemic co-adaptation. That would be interesting. Um... Yeah, this is like, I think this is like one sentence from here all the way down to here. It's like, come on, break that up a little bit. Maybe it was written in a different language, it sounds better, but it's a long sentence. We turn to cultural citizenship and explain and examine why it struggles for a foothold in a landscape shaped by epistemic violence. Well, if you got epistemic power, you don't want to give that up. To address this issue, yeah, well, everyone has a problem with the dominant, uh, theories of the day the theories of the day get they do things to protect themselves to keep themselves at the top not just the people the theories protect themselves too so Lakatos from the philosophy of science to address this issue while avoiding the proper problem of democracy becoming subservient to a normative theory of citizenship and therefore the governmentalization of citizenship as a learn as a learning process we draw on Dewey's thoughts on democracy and education which provide a theory of democracy whereby the citizen plays an active role in the construction of democracy we argue that Dewey's conception of citizenship repoliticized by democracy allowing us to speak of democratic citizenship Delante rather than confining citizenship to membership of a society or the bearer of rights which informs democratic theory. More specifically, it is a theory of democracy whereby citizenship is seen as a communicative citizenship with de democratic aim. That is, a, of construction of the relationship between society and the state by shifting the emphasis away from a model of citizenship that rests on political foundationalism in the sense that a given model of democracy can be justified only by an appeal to the self to self evident truth about human nature, the, na the natural human nature, natural right, or other pre political or normative foundations towards an emphasis on democratic enga en engagement, citizenship itself becomes a mean for mitigating epistemic violence through reconstructing politics and thus essential to the to democratic correctiveness. We conclude that Plumwood's philosophy philosophy alongside John Dewey's work on democracy and education provide a mutually supportive theoretical theoretical framework for effective dem democratic inquiry aimed towards interconnective deliberative practice and corrective methodology for epistemic accountability. So away from the current sort of government like rules and laws towards some sort of uh, engagement and learning theory participation government okay <clears throat> cultural citizenship as an education educative process citizenship as educative while there remains much contention over definitions of democracy and disagreement over com competing models, the term democracy is now generally character characterized by two principles of power relations between individuals and institutions in society. Citizen control over public decision making and two, distributive equality in the exercising of citizen decision making. Many models of democracy fit within this broad definition, but this is so because historically democracy is a social and political construct that has been shaped by diverse ideologies under very specific social circumstances. In its liberal form, de democratic institutions reaffirm majority rule and have in practice broadly failed to strengthen these principles as evidenced by increasing social divisions such as those outlined by Plumwood above. Consequently, democracy fails to live up to its own rhetoric. It, rhetoric. The existing dominant conception of democracy is underpinned by an adversarial conception of politics and is therefore antagonistic towards democratic ways of life, that is, fails to facil facilitate dem democratic correctiveness. On democratic correctiveness, Plumwood 95 notes that democratic systems that are un are, are, are able to democratic Systems that are able to articulate and respond to the needs of the least privileged 
lip privileged should be better than less democratic systems that reserve participation in de decision making for privileged groups. This is because radical inequality is both itself a hindrance to correctiveness and a key indicator of other hindrances to, so to societal correctiveness. Liberal democracy also rests on the assumption that without representative government, free and fair elections at regular and frequent intervals and mandate and merit as rationales for governance, there is no democracy. But this view results in serious ethical failures. In representative systems of democracy, power is concentrated on a small number of politicians and high-level bureaucrats, and citizen input into this policy is minimal, political accountability is low, and elected representatives susceptible to vested interests, misconduct, and corruption. Yes, the news of the day is that a bunch of senators who were on the uh, committees looking at coronavirus sold all their stocks while they were telling everyone that it would be fine, and then the stock market crashed a week later. And what's the over-under on any of them getting fired or resigning? They're not getting fired. Moreover, liberal democracy is underpinned by a conception of citizenship that is reduced to a formalistic relationship to the state as one of rights and duties, a legal status bound up in pre-political notions of liberty, the private sphere, and consumer rights, to the neglect of the public sphere as the location of citizenship. While with this shift towards neoliberal politics since the 1970s and emphasis on decentralization, deregulation, and privatization, the concept of citizenship has once again become strikingly li linked to the market. And thus, the citizen as consumer. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're saying on the TV nowadays. There's no buying power because no one has any money. These factors can be seen as rigidities which hinder the democratic correctness of social institutions. Insofar as these rigidities result from the concentration of power on a small number of politicians and high-level bureaucrats, which protects privilege. Yeah, they are they are actually going to do the Andrew Yang, Martin Luther King Jr. cut us everyone a universal basic income check because they're getting nervous. Actually going to try to do something like that. Like, shake my head. I could use the money. A neglected dimension in developing capacities for democratic correctiveness is education, particularly the idea of a citizenship as a learning process. The idea of citizenship as a learning process. According to Delante, the dominant liberal discourse on citizenship has become indistinguishable indistinguishable from disciplinary citizenship that permeates official policy documents in which learning is reduced to citizenship classes and formal memberships of the polity. Yeah, he refers to this as the, governmental, the governmentalization of citizenship as a learning process to indicate a governmental discursive coding of citizenship as a cognitive competence. In this discourse, citizenship is constructed by codes, categories, and modes of classification that reflect a governmental strategy into which the individual as citizen is inserted. Thus, the immigrant becomes a, the, becomes a, sick a citizen by participating in a discourse that redefines social relations according to fairly fixed categories. What is noticeable in this is that the citizen, the language of citizenship and learning, is taken over by the state and defined according to a set of rigid categories. In terms of education, this governmental this governmentalization of citizenship is characterized by governmental discourse that has remained within rights discourse and formal formal membership uh, of the sorry formal membership of the polity with emphasis on equality over difference and advocates the idea of a common public culture regardless of ethnic groupings. Critics claim that such measures dilute non-Western values in favor of Western values and advocate cultural assimilation or exclusion world, or exclude worldviews that do not sit well within the framework of non-liberal values. Consequently, the introduction of civics and citizenship education as compulsory part of the secondary school curriculum tend to emphasize the teaching of putative common civic values and the workings of institutions as such as the electoral and criminal justice systems. In other words, learning processes are reduced to formal learning, and the assumption that what needs to be learned is the official values of the polity is as interpreted by public officials. All other values and knowledge are subsumed. It also assumes that the individual learning process convert into a collective learning outcome. However, collective learning processes operate on different levels, and relations between individual and collective learning is complex, and therefore cannot be assumed, as citizenship is a process undertaken by both individual 
collectively and collectively understand the collective learning processes is paramount to understanding citizenship whereby citizens citizens learn about shape and society Delante contrasts disciplinary system with cultural citizenship, which makes a greater connection between learning and citizenship as a collective discursive learning process that occurs on individual, group, and institutional levels. According to Delante, any discussion about learning must begin with the recognition that learning occurs on different levels and that there are quite different kinds of learning. The way individuals learn is quite different from the way societies learn. Cultural citizenship moves away from the fixed rule learning model implicit in disciplinary citizenship towards a dynamic view of citizenship conceived in terms of learning processes that have a developmental and transformative impact on the learning subject. By learning, Delante means cognitive processes that allow information to be combined in different ways to provide a subject, individual, a group, a society, to have a capacity for action, learning may therefore entail learning to learn and thus reflexivity. In this way, learning entails empowerment or the capacity of a subject to reproduce itself. <coughs> Excuse me. To be emphasized then is the processual nature of learning, which is an open process defined in movement rather than finality. This view of learning suggests a cultural dimension to it that is cultural culture as making or doing, learning involving agency on the part of the learning subject. The cognitive structures and structures operate in learning processes connect different frames and codes. Learning is thus cul a cultural process of creation and construction. Delante's attention to learning processes emphasizes learning as one, an individual biography, two, an intersubjective conduit con occurring as interpersonal cultural narratives that provide interpretations of the world for social construction by which individual learning is translated and coordinated into collective learning, and three, cultural learning that eventually becomes embodied in social institutions. The relation between these three levels is complex, but he thinks can be summed up as process, connectivism, development, construction, and transformation. Those are all very big words in themselves. <sighs> Such learning can change normative and epistemic frameworks that provide structures to guide social action and social change. Such changes in learning result from a constructivist process of communicative links between common experiences, cognitive processes, forms of cultural translation, and discourses of empowerment, which hold which he holds can arise out of both ordinary experiences and major crises and catastrophes, such as the experience of victimhood or injustice. It appears that an essential dimension of the cognitive experience of citizenship is the way in which individual life stories are connected with wider cultural discourses. Cultural citizenship not only enhances the individual's cognitive competencies, but has the potential to bring about collective learning. This seems very... Uh uh, sort of optimistic in how much people want to work for things. I mean, that's sort of the thing about, uh, the institutional citizenship described above. You just get it. It's free. And like the years like, Oh, you've got all these great things. Here you go. This seems like it requires an awful lot of effort to learn a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm sure it's better, but I don't know if people are going to do it. People aren't like going to be like motivated to give up what they, uh, or just getting for nothing at the moment for being the right part of a group. And they're definitely not going to want to, well, maybe they'll want to structure society better, but it's going to be a hard slog. Yeah, disciplinary. Okay. Unlike disciplinary citizenship, which rigidly views citizenship as a formal body of knowledge or proficiency, Cultural citizenship is imbued with mechanisms for democratic correctiveness because citizenship occurs in communicative situations and therefore connects individuals to their society through sustained narratives consisting of memories, shared values, and experiences, which speaks to Plumwood's concerns of separation from other. Similarly, Delandy points to a lack of shared language to communicate dissatisfaction as, as contributing to increased social, social ills and pathologies without such a language. People and groups may experience a loss of recognition from feeling alienated and thus a lack of sense of belonging as citizens, which can lead to political decisions based on fear, ignorance, and to racism or xenophobia. Yeah, they're calling it the China flu still. However, he does not address colonialization, a major source of cultural rigidities which perpetuates xenophobia. On the issues of education's ability to address xenophobia, Delante has the following to say. 
Much of the problem of widespread xenophobia is due to failure, failures in learning mechanisms and can be counteracted by encouraging active cultural citizenship that can lead to a transformation of the cultural models that constitute collective learning. My argument is the future of citizenship as a strategy to oppose xenophobia will have to cultivate what it might be called a new language or a new cogn or cognitive structures for learning. While a shared language is important, we argue that the ways in which colonialization is perpetuated in education, society, and politics must be taken into account if we are to create a new language that breaks the epistemic violence of the past and present. We concur with Delante regarding the necessity of generating a more discursive citizenship. However, to overcome alienation, the emphasis must be on democratic correctiveness, which requires the capacity for multiple cultures to flourish. This is especially important and lacking if we consider that, that political systems are often founded on the annihilation and replacement of epistemic frameworks with unwelcome epistemologies, colonialization being a relevant example. Australia's history of colonialization is a clear case of the imposition of one culture on, on, onto another, beginning with the extinction of British sovereignty to Australia in 1788 and the eventual passing of the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution Act by British Parliament. The Axel Australian colonies become a federation in 1901, an event that is often seen as merely political, but all too easily rele relegated to the past, rather being viewed as the imposition of ongoing epistemic and ontological structures. These structures continue to dominate and control the social and political landscape and shape cultural identity of Australia to this day, including the educational landscape. Yeah, so... You traded one set of bums for, well, not bums, jerks for another set of jerks. It's a way of politics. I think the report just came out that the uh, Finland is the happiest country at the moment. Should go to Finland. I wonder if they have a coronavirus in Finland. They probably do. Education as a site of cultural rep reproduction is often steeped in assimilation, which we argue is a form of epistemic violence and uh, an obstacle to correctiveness. Epistemic violence then must be addressed as if cultural citizenship is to be achieved. The lack of a shared language Delante speaks of can be viewed as what Fricker calls a hermeneutic gap insofar as there is a gap in collective interpretation which disadvantages a group disadvantages groups when it comes to making sense of their social exp experiences. This gap, when a result of colonial built environment, causes ep epistemic violence to individuals and communities. Thus, to respond to and correct such violence requires, excuse me, on experiences that do not fit the dominant story. That is, the experiences of individuals and the communities that have been silenced through colonialization, past and present. This work is imperative if we are to cultivate a new language or shared values which include the values and voices of those who do not easily fit into the dominant narrative. In the next section we look at to John Dewey to provide possible pathways towards a form of cultural citizenship that mitigates epistemic violence. Okay, moving right along. Let's see how long we go on. Yeah, not so bad. The importance of Dewey's thoughts on dem democracy and education cannot be exaggerated. Although writing in the early 1900s, his influence still resonates today, and there's much we can still learn from him. As Philip Cam aptly asserts, I like this sort of uh, block assertion. It's kind of cool that it's all the way over. When it comes to the connections between philosophy, democracy, and education, we could hardly find a more rewarding philosopher than John Dewey. Not only does the request for the qu the request, not only does the quest for democracy animate the whole vast canvas of his work, but Dewey ha also has an abiding concern with both education and the social value of philosophy, which makes the intersection between philosophy, democracy, and education in education, Dewey's home ground, nor is Dewey's work lacking in contemporary social relevance. His vision of the democratic society is one that is democratic throughout the whole life of its social fabric, and which thereby supplies everyday life with greater opportunities for human fulfillment, remains vital today, when democratic societies are still popularly conceived of merely as those that enjoy a certain form of government. Our task, however, will be explore Dewey's assumptions about democratic society and offer a proposal for the adaptation of his idea of an inquiring society achieved through education premised on his notion of reconstruction. 
According to Dewey, 1916, reconstruction of knowledge and experience requires a reciprocal relationship between habit and habitat. Yet, yeah, any this, see, this is work. It's like I hope you're right, but like this is gonna be a lot of work for anyone. They don't want to have to rethink th what they're doing and where they're doing it. Indeed, he asserts that the variety of peoples and environment, their contrast with familiar scenes, furnishes infinite s stimulation. Con oh, contrast with their contrast with familiar scenes. Okay, I wrote, I read the. I was like, what? When an organism is no longer able to affect its habitat, but must only adapt to it, the habitat becomes dominant, a built environment in the sense we described. Yeah, that's a prison. The dominant habitat can render existing habit habits obsolete, and, sub and subsequently individuals, groups, and even cultures can become alienated as these habits are no longer suited to the environment. To put it in terms of liberal democracy, liberal discourse creates the habitat which backgrounds and nullifies the habits of certain humans and natural processes. Well, I don't know what you, the meaning of natural is right here. Like it may have been a culture, a histor historical cultural process, but why is it natural? Um, it may have been incidental and in going back how long, but I don't know if the natural is really the, uh, sense of the word needed there in doing so it has the potential not only to restrict habits, but create obstacles further to further changes and reconstruction of the habitat on which humans depend. Well, no, definitely what happens is the habitat re self-reinforces itself definitely when it's already uh, in favor of those who are already in power. That's sort of how things stay in power for so long. Not just having the power, but making the world to keep them in power. The built environment in this case, the dominant liberal democratic habitat constructs obstacles to dem yes democratic correctness and thus the development of an inquiring society. Sure does. So that means, but that also means there's a lot of work to do. Education as a foundational building block of Western liberal democracy tends to be cast in terms of the individual. It focuses on equipping individuals with the skills and knowledge to define and pursue their own goals and to contribute to society's full-fledged autonomous citizens. However, in pluralistic societies, not all groups support the development of autonomous individuals. Many in indi indigenous groups are ontologically relational relationally oriented, and the notion of an abstract individual, which is the hallmark of Western liberal democracies, can be seen at, to weaken or challenge a group's communal relations and ways of being. In terms of cultural continuity, survival is threatened, and formal or state-provided liberal education is often active in blocking attempts for renewal. Undeniably for all people, small groups, larger societies, and nation-states, continuing survival relies on educational processes, whether formal or informal. As Dewey 1916 announced in Democracy and Education, in its broadest sense, education is the means of the social continuity of life. It is noteworthy that... Dewey does not emphasize education as equipping individuals for life. The purpose of education is the social continuity of life. To Dewey, education is not preparation for life, but it is life itself, to which he added that it is a form of associated living. In this sense, education is a form of cultural renewal, a learning process responsible for the continuity of what it means to be part of culture. It can therefore encompass the values, the ethics, the language, the land, the law, and the lore. Well, that's kind of a nice little... Uh, phrasing there you know when you talk this much you start losing words um it's like a tr i meant to say turn a phrase or something else but i just couldn't pull it out in time regarding indigenous peoples in australia i mean watson points out that indigenous law philosophy and knowledge knowledges are core to our indigenous past and they still hold our present worlds together promising a future for first nations peoples even in the face of colonial colonialism which has done much to marginalize first nations to sever education from culture to sever education from culture is to commit violence that is not confined to any specific time place or physical act but is ongoing violence in the form of knowledge subjugation epistemic violence that deprives the people from effectively participating in a pluralist society and from contributing to its diversity and thus continues the genocidal project of assimilation Mary Graham succinctly describes the absurdity un underpinning what Wolf calls the logic of elimination, by which multiple aspects of the continual life of one's group, one life of one group of people, are denied by another. If one true way is posited, sooner or later, individuals or groups are inclined to idealize, idealize it. Rigid thinking then follows. There's the 
uh, uh, zealotry I, was, I mentioned earlier. And the formation of groups of true believers, chosen people, sects, religions, parties, etc. cannot be far behind. Historically, different groups and individuals have assumed that there is only one absolute answer to the question of existence, usually their own. I mean, I wouldn't go with usually, I'd say like nearly always their own. If this assumption is accepted, then logically there must be thousands if not millions of potential absolute answers to this age-old question. That a rigidity of thinking drove and continues to drive the elimination of life on the Australian continent, and others have been extensively argued by scholars from diversity disciplines, for example, feminism, law, education, and decolonialization scholarship more broadly. Dewey's pragmatic, pragmatist view of the word, world, which is a naturalistic approach to knowledge as the result of an, uh, an active adaptation of the human organism to its environment can help educationally challenge such rigid thinking. His view constitutes a rejection of the dualistic epistemological and metaphysical views of philosophy wherein the universe is static, complete, and unchanging. To Dewey, endings are adaptations that signify new beginnings, and as he recognized that an end is also a means to yet another end in a continual process of change, a continual reconstruction. Reconstruction is not a is not progress toward any definitive or known end or final goal, but rather the adaptive ability of the organism and environment. Reconstruction therefore is always incomplete, and further problematic problematic situations alter the relationship between the organism and the environment. For humans, it is the relationship between belief habits and the habitat that needs to be a dialectic dialectic relationship for cultural decisions to be effective. Dewey's emphasis on the habit and habitat is at the heart of his epistemology. His shift towards a biological concept of experience and by extension education recognizes the plasticity of humankind as part of the greater plasticity of nature. Dewey's shift in epistemology equates to a shift in values that many environmental philosophers have argued is essential to mitigating all the forms of environmental degradation. Dewey was convinced that learning through doing, insofar as we learn from reflecting on our experiences, is the best approach to education. The lessons we glean from experiences, gleam or glean, from experiences both inside and outside the classroom shape how we see and interact with others and the world, that is, with our habit and habitat. Moreover, Dewey's emphasis on learning through doing links students' experiences outside the classroom, their home, neighborhood, and local community, which is part of what Dewey calls the greater community, to that which happens in the classroom. As learning is unavoidable from the earliest beings of a child's life through family, friends, and community until they start school and are influenced by further friendships, teachers, and both set in, in both the set and hidden curriculum, attention to the relationship between schooling and life, both inside and outside the classroom, it is vital is vital to educating systems. While being consumers in the greater society today is part of a life for mo most people, attention also needs to be on dissolving the dualism between consumer and citizen. This is especially vital in relation to environmental education if we are to address Plumwood's contention that liberal democracy has, through its failure to be corrective, failed both ecologically and de de both ecology and democracy. Yeah. Eco-social citizenship as a learning process. If Plumwood is right in arguing that it is the chains of liberalism that tie our governments to ecological devastation, then it is its citizens who must be the ones to cut them. To educate citizens fit for the task, we must strive, be, must strive beyond the construction of the liberal individual. To instantiate the kind of ecologically and culturally responsive democracy that Plumwood and Dewey advocate, we must educate towards a new kind of citizen, and to do so, we argue, requires democratic education rather than education for democracy. Whereas education for democracy focuses on the acquisition of knowledge and skills as a means to improve the capacity of future citizens, that it, <laughs> they talk about this a lot. The capacity of future citizens to exercise competent autonomy, democratic education recognizes the social role of schooling as that of reconstruction and that children and young people have an integral role to play in shaping democracy. Education for democracy, which includes teaching or instilling values such as respect for liberal institutions, <coughs> excuse me, civics or political education aimed at reinforcing of political knowledge, 
namely liberal d democratic values, principles and procedures, and political literacy, which places emphasis on political competence, may serve political leaders who have a vested interest in promoting a particular conception of citizenship as a means for enabling individuals, organizations, and nations to meet the challenges of an increasingly competitive world to the neglect of involving people in a continuing process of education aimed at self-actualization and a learning society. In doing so, education for democracy fails to promote the corrective is required for effective democracy. Effective education, on the other hand, is inherently corrective as emphasis is on reconstruction through dialogue, dialogic inquiry. In this sense, democracy is an educational process, a form of practice, and not something to educate toward. Emphasis is also Emphasis also needs to be on environmental education grounded in, in the Deweyan sense, in authentic social pro pro problems in authentic social problems that require students to draw simultaneously on knowledge and method from multiple disciplines in an interconnected manner in order to work through such problems, rather than being subject to curriculum hierarchy, which maintains that supposedly abstract school subjects like mathematics and physics are more valuable than subjects associated with concrete experience, practicality, and the body, such as physical education and vocational subjects. This is important because if learning is unavoidable, so too is identi identity formation. What we learn from our identity, both our individual and our national identity. Indeed, the task of education implicitly or explicitly is identity formation and nation building through curriculum, hidden or otherwise. Therefore, the relationship between self and environment, belief, habit, and habitat needs to be the focus of education if we are to dissolve the dualism of consumer and citizen and understand how the integral relation between self and environment affects us. In other words, liberal identity, the relation, the rational, autonomous individual who judges what the good life is for them, is but one kind of identity among many, yet it is the dominant identity perpetuated through educational emphasis on self-development and skills to compete in a world of other individuals seeking resources. The task of environmental education is to extend the boundaries of self beyond the liberal individual to experience that point to the to need to revise our conception of the self and its relation to relation to the non-human other uh, opposition to oppressive practices and abandonment and critique of cultural allegiances to the dominance of the human species and its bonding against non-humans and those humans classed as non-humans yeah that's just a lot of words i mean is reinforcing the point, but it's a lot of words. I mean, the task of environment is to extend the boundaries of self. I mean, yeah, I'm not in love with all the language here, but like uh, the points, well, I mean, it's a lot of quotes interspersed with a lot of, a lot of the stuff. Yeah, again, like the other political uh, paper from the other night, they, they have to set up a narrative to make their point. And so you get into the narrative, and narratives require more, uh, they just require more uh, words to maintain the narrative in some sense. It's, if you're going to argue in that way, this is this sort of comes with the, uh, this is par for the course. And so it's an interesting sort of like, you get drawn along in a different way than like, uh, logic paper, but it, I mean, it still has a, the, uh, rhetorical force, the same as a logic paper, but it's just, it has to sort of build in more, uh, stuff because in sort of the analytic, more analytic things like, uh, or just more logic-y things, you get a lot of, uh, resources from the logic, but this sort of thing, it just, you have to sort of get all the way through the, uh, the story to really understand all the parts of it and how they sort of fit together. It's just, uh, takes a while. Educational emphasis, therefore, needs to be on eco-social citizenship as a learning process that enhances the collective learning capacity of so society, a form of cultural citizenship with a focus on inclusion of multiple knowledge systems, not as topics or as issues to critique, but as starting points for inquiry, in which Western contemporary techno-sciences, rather than being taken as Definitional of knowledge, rationality, or objectivity should be treated as a variety of knowledge systems. No, I'm not, I mean, I'm down with that. That's cool. Failing to include variety, you see, you got all that stuff, and then it's like there's one last bit. I'm like, no, I'd like I'm completely, I'm down with that, but like I come from a different angle. 
failing to include varieties of knowledge systems even either through text or their knowledge of teachers, students, parents, and mem members of the wider community fails to interrupt the dominant narrative, leaving it unquestioned, or, to re reiterate Freire's words, leaving the dominant ideology in place. Yes, here's the problem. If you do it in the other way, you just leave everything the way it was. In short, the teacher needs to be aware of the limiting capacity of epistemic violence to create a safe space for varieties of knowledge systems so intellectual freedom can flourish for all. Yeah, see, you, you don't, if you don't get in the way of the other one, it's just going to stay there because it's already dominant. So you have to get, like, if you're going to break up, like, a behemoth, like, a big thing, you have to, they have uh, their own inertia. And it's like, the bigger they are, the more, sort of, you have to do to, like, dislodge them from the way they're going. To facilitate such learning then requires going beyond Delante's understanding of cultural citizenship with its emphasis on role of communication and learning process in which cultural culture and citizenship are connected in a cognitive relationship. Inclusion. Plumwood's criticism of liberal democracy failing both ecologically and, and both ecology and democracy cannot be ignored. In addition, the accumulating evidence of anthropogenic climate change demands a change in our consumer and citizen habits. This puts pressure on democracy to have the capacity for correctiveness to bring about change, to facilitate interconnective, deliberative practice, and corrective methodology for epistemic accountability, Not to not exclude epistemic frameworks currently subordinate to the dominant logic of liberal demo democratic governmentality and discourses that perpetuate radical idea inequalities. <coughs> Excuse me. As a society, we can no longer ignore the repercussions of colonialization, especially the silencing of indigenous understanding of human relations to land and country in the face of anthropogenic climate change. To address these concerns will require re-emphasizing the relationship between belief habits and habitats, inevitably the reshaping of democracy. Such a change requires a move away from rugged individualism toward a cultural citizenship that emphasizes citizenship as a learning process. We have argued in favor of dem democratic education as a way of reconstructing citizenship as a dialectic process which enables the democratic correctiveness of social institutions. In this sense, citizenship is an educative process that is life itself an associated form of living rather than a set of rights and duties. You see, you always got to worry about if something is like a whole form of living, have you said too much? Have you argued for too much? But yeah, I mean, that doesn't take away from their point. But like, if it's everything entirely, have you, I mean, even if, if this was a hundred page paper, I mean, a thousand page book, um, can you really just have defined living in that space? I mean, maybe, but I doubt it. An associated form of living rather than a set of rights and duties. As such, citizens have an integral role to play in shaping democracy. In the case of schooling, children would then practice democracy as an ongoing process of collaborative inquiry that aims at self-correction as a fundamental aspect of inquiring communities. Pedagogically, this provides a means to distribute epistemic power in the classroom and opportunities for each child to exert epistemic influence, which is con a constitutive condition of non-domination. Non <laughs> non Insofar as each child can affect a change in the epistemic situation, which that child or others are in through sharing beliefs or persuading others. Okay, so that's kind of fun. So they're arguing for changing the way we look at how we educate ourselves and other people as, I mean, not an ongoing process, but as uh, and a situated process between habit and habitat. And therefore, that's what it is to be a citizen. And you define your citizenship in that way. So you're in sort of sense, it's the old go find your tribe, go find your people. You have to go change your ha habits and habitats to more uh, co-evolve with the uh, your surroundings. It's like, okay, I mean, I'm down with that. But I mean, the, making that a political choice, I have no idea how there's any way the people in power, the current power structures will actually turn in that direction. Like, it's sort of, it's a good idea, but, like, maybe we can start 
as they said, train people from the next generation do this. But at the current rate we're going, we're not getting anywhere. So maybe it's like, sure, let's do it. Let's train some kids to be more uh, de democratic in their learning. I mean, that's cool. Okay. Thanks for watching. If you're still here, I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, send me a note uh, if you want to hear me talk about anything else or if you have any other comments or questions. Have a good night. Stay safe, folks.